Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Allison Burns. Thank you for joining us. We are going to cover medication storage and security in the congregate care setting. I have no financial interests or relationships to disclose. We'd of course like to thank our partners at BSAS and the Department of Public Health. By the end of this presentation, we would like you to be able to compare and contrast individual and shared storage units for medications, list the individuals who may be given direct access to medications, identify where to find information about FDA and drug manufacturer storage requirements, and give examples of medications that may be allowed on person and stored outside the designated medication room. Here is the codes that apply to our license and contracted programs by BSAS. It is 105 CMR 164. We are going to get into each one of these, but this is just the regulation in case you want to see it. So here, locked secure cabinet that is only accessible to designate staff positions. Patients cannot have access to their medications directly. The medications that are brought in by the residents must be separate from the facility supply, except residents that maintain uh, possession of medications to treat acute episodes. So think of asthma attacks, allergic reactions, those can be kept on them at the program's discretion. Remember, if any injectable drugs are used, such as insulin, you must provide containers for safe storage and proper disposal of those sharps. And then of course, any medications requiring refrigeration shall be kept in a refrigerator in the same area where the other medications are stored. And then finally, make sure you are maintaining a record of any of those medications which remain in the possession of the residents. So those medications that are allowed on person to treat acute episodes. Okay. All medications, including countable and non-countable prescriptions, over-the-counters, expired, discontinued, and abandoned medications must be stored properly in the congregate care setting. Medication storage areas and units must safeguard patient confidentiality, secure medications from loss or theft, meet FDA, USP, and drug manufacturer storage requirements for medications. Remember, medications, even inactive ones awaiting disposal, should not be stored in offices, employee desks, closets, or spaces outside the designated medication room or medication storage units. Medication access. Only authorized staff have access to medications in the medication storage units. Currently, there's no specific license or certification to authorize staff. However, unlicensed staff should fulfill their program or employer's criteria and training requirements before they are handling any patient medications. One of the newer regulations is the titles, so not the exact names of the individuals, but the titles. So for example, program director, clinical supervisor, the titles of these authorized staff members must be posted. Uh, the list may be posted directly on the medication cabinet or in the medication room if multiple storage units such as a locker system is used. Residents may need access to their medications urgently or for an emergency, so a best practice is making sure that there's one authorized staff member on each shift, including overnights, weekends, and holidays. Direct care staff, meaning those who work directly with the residents may have direct access to the medication. So remember direct care, direct access. These individuals, examples of them include recovery specialists, caseworkers, case managers, intake or access coordinators and care coordinators, counselors, clinicians, social workers, therapists, mental health and addiction professionals and medication specialists registered nurses, registered pharmacists, and any other qualified healthcare professionals, clinical supervisors, assistant directors, and program directors, and finally, any other patient or resident-facing staff who are responsible for facilitating a therapeutic milieu or providing coverage and milieu supervision. 
unauthorized staff. Okay, the following people really should not have direct access to the medications or the medication storage areas unless there is an emergency or extenuating circumstance. These include your non-direct care or indirect care staff. So any janitorial, maintenance, dietary, clerical, billing, or IT and communication employees. And also any individuals, including people who are in the medical, clinical, or direct care staff who are not employed or contracted by the program to work with residents or resident medications. So if you have someone who is on site, but they are not contracted or employed by the program, it does not matter if they are a medical professional. They need to have permission before they can engage the residents and handle their medications storing medications in a timely manner. So part of proper medication storage is actually putting away medications and putting them away and out of sight as soon as they come in uh, to safeguard patient privacy and to prevent theft loss or any diversion. So do not leave a shift without putting medications away. Never leave a medication out for several hours in plain sight or overnight. Again, you can learn a lot about somebody from the medications they take and labels contain protected health information. So just leaving that medication out on a counter is actually putting that person's privacy at risk. I would say follow this best practice, the 30 minute rule. So put medications away within 30 minutes of arrival or delivery, or as soon as reasonably possible. I would suggest creating some troubleshooting training. So that means creating some sort of standard system or process that explains how to store medications safely when the program is either short staff or there's a chaotic environment, maybe there is a mental health crisis going on and it just really, is there something that is preventing you from being able to follow that 30 minute rule? So if you're not able to follow that rule, come up with some sort of troubleshooting so the employees know what to do and know how to safeguard that medication properly. Medication storage requirements, okay. Prescription and over-the-counter medications must be kept in the original containers with the original labels, including the directions for use. So that actually has to do with a regulation 105 CMR 164. And the reason for this is the original container is actually approved by the FDA. They're designed to protect medicine from heat, air, light, and moisture that can actually alter the effectiveness of the medication. And that is part of regulation 21 CFR 211 subpart G. So that CFR stands for code of federal regulation. So that is a federal guideline. So definitely store those medications and medication storage units in a cool, dry place that can maintain a stable temperature between 68 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Do not store medications or medication storage units near those bright windows, meaning direct sunlight, sinks, space heaters, radiators, air conditioners, or humidifiers. Again, light can actually uh, inactivate medications, which is why they are dispensed in packaging, such as most commonly the amber vials you see from a pharmacy. That's because they're inactivated by light. So again, make sure that your med room is set up so it is protecting those medications from the environmental elements. Okay, do not store medications in spaces affected by humidity or any outdoor weather. Do not store medications directly on the floor. All the storage units should provide ample space between the floor and the medications to prevent water damage to those medications in there is a flood or some sort of uh, water leak. Do not store medications alongside personal belongings or non-medication items. That includes patient and employee personal belongings, okay? Do not store them near cleaning supplies, alcohol-based products, or any toxic substances. We do not want these medications being contaminated. Do not store medications in a refrigerator that contains a freezer or defroster. So what I mean by this is a dorm style refrigerator where it is one refrigerator. And when you open that up within the refrigeration space, there is a 
freezer at the top. That is not allowed because it actually will damage the medications. Um, it's not able to maintain a stable temperature throughout the fridge. At the top, it's going to be colder near that freezer. It's not going to be able to maintain the uh, regulated temperature, which is 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit. That is actually set by the United States Pharmacopeia, USP 1079. That is the regulation. If you're if you have refrigerated medications, they have to stay within that strict range, 36 to 46 degrees. So what I would recommend is do monitor your temperatures with the refrigerator. You can do that with a refrigerator thermometer. They are both analog and digital. There is an analog one at the top of the screen on the right side. As you can see, that thermometer has negative 20 Fahrenheit all the way up to 80. And it might be hard to see, but if you look, there's a very small section that is gray right in the middle between freezing and warm. That's how narrow the refrigeration uh, range is for medications. It is critical that they stay in that stable environment. So what I would say is Get that standalone refrigerator, meaning it can be a mini fridge, but it cannot have a defroster, cannot have a freezer. Uh, get one of these thermometers. The analog thermometers are anywhere from 10 to $15, but of course they can range upwards to over a hundred. And what I would do is use a med uh, fridge temp log, and then you can check that log um, regularly, but you should probably assign a staff member that checks the fridge thermometer every morning, just records on the log. Because if there is um, some sort of compromise, so let's say that it the fridge goes into the freezing or maybe it gets warm and goes into the warm, um, you're gonna have to come up with a plan of how to properly store those medications. Again, it, it can damage any type of injectable medication that's kept in there, it's very important that these medications are stored properly. Do locate that medication refrigerator in the medication storage room or storage area. Do store medical foods such as Ensure. So sometimes people are prescribed Ensure or other dietary liquid uh, liquids because of nutritional deficiencies. Do store those in the medication fridge, but absolutely do not store uh, regular food or beverages. I would suggest just to keep everyone on the same page and so they know this is the medication refrigerator, do post a no food or beverages or meds only on the fridge. That is a best practice. In the corner, I have a example of a magnet. It actually says medication refrigerator, maintain the temperature between 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit. You can purchase one of those online. Never store food or drinks in the fridge, even if there's no meds in it. Again, even if there's no meds in it, why? Food can cause bacterial growth and it does not comply with standard infection control and storage integrity practices. So if you have food or drinks in there that's not medical foods, you're going to have to sanitize that fridge before you put medications in it. Uh, pathogenic bacteria can actually grow in refrigerated temperatures. So please make sure that you are complying with those integrity practices when it comes to refrigeration. Some medications need to be refrigerated before they are opened and other medications such as certain probiotics and eye drops actually need to be refrigerated after they're opened. Some insulins can be stored in the refrigerator or at room temperature. However, the expiration date may vary based on which storage option is selected. So typically, if you keep it in the refrigerator, the expiration date or beyond use date is going to be longer than if you keep it outside the refrigerator, meaning at room temperature, it's gonna probably have a smaller window that it's able to be used. The FDA does require by law that every prescription medication and every over-the-counter medication be labeled with the storage information. So for prescriptions, RXs, you can read the prescription label. Um, sometimes these are stapled to the outside of a bag. Of course, you cannot fit everything on the actual label that goes on a bottle or a blister pack. So if you do not have that information on the blister pack or on the medication bottle, sometimes they'll stick an auxiliary sticker on there that says refrigerate. Again, if you don't see it and you have a question, you can go online and the FDA puts every medication package insert there. So there I have the um, www.accessdata.gov 
www.fda.gov. And just so you know, it is actually ACCESS data. So there is an S missing there, but you can Google FDA package insert and the package insert will include the storage requirements. For your over-the-counters, your OTCs, you're gonna read the drug facts label, which is on the packaging. It's gonna be under the other information section. If for some reason you cannot read this information, you can always go to www.knowyourotcs.org. If all else fails and you're still unable to locate the information or have a question about storage, contact a local pharmacist. They are drug experts. They're going to know how something should be stored. Here's an example of Tylenol and OTC. And as you can see, I have blown up what is, what is on the back of the bottle. It also appears on the back of the box. This is the drug facts, all right? So again, OTC storage information is listed under other information section. The FDA made it very easy for us. They always have the same sections in the same order for every over-the-counter that is marketed in the United States. So right there under the directions, you're going to see other information. And for this example, it says store between 20 to 25 degrees Celsius, also known as 68 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, avoid high humidity. So this Tylenol needs to be stored at room temperature. Here is an example of a prescription medication. So there may be different requirements uh, for unopened and opened, meaning opened in use, insulin pens. In this example, we have Solostar, which is a long acting insulin. Right there on the package, you see unopened Solostar. So in this example, the unopened pens, meaning the ones that are not in use, must be refrigerated. Once they are opened and in use, they actually have to be kept at room temperature. So again, very, very important that you are reading the storage information. And as you can see, once it's opened and at room temperature, it must be discarded in 28 days after being opened. That is why you have on the box, if you look towards the bottom to the left of the SKU code, there's an initial use date. So there's five pens in this box. And the purpose of this is say pen one, I started today. I would put today's date. And then I would know 28 days from now, it has to be discarded regardless of whether there's medication remaining in it or not. Medications allowed on person. So residents should not have direct access to the medication storage areas. So where medications are stored. However, there are medications that are used in acute or emergency situations that may be appropriate for the resident to keep on them. Must, you must keep a record, a complete record of all the prescription and over-the-counter medicines that remain in the resident's possession. That is actually a regulation. It's in 105 CMR 164, you have to keep a record, okay? So you must document the medication name, the strength, directions for use, and the quantity. I would also, just as a best practice, document exactly where that medication is kept in case of an emergency or a non-responsive patient. So for example, you use a standard medication tracking sheet or you use a standard uh, medication self-administration record, a MAR, and you can write on the top, you know, put the name, put the strength, directions, and the quantity that's gonna go up with the resident. And I would just put stored on person, resident's top drawer. Why? If someone is having an allergic reaction and cannot speak to you, it is not going to help them if we can't find their EpiPen. So I would recommend documenting exactly where that med is. Uh, you, again, we just said this, you may document on the same uh, medication self-administration record or tracking sheet as other prescription medications, or you can use another medication form. Maybe you have a specific medications allowed on person form. It's really up to the program's discretion. You just have to keep a complete record. Specific medications allowed on person is at the discretion of the licensed program. Um, these can, be, these can be different for every place, depending on your setting. These are just examples of what kind of medications you could think about including. So naloxone, brand name Narcan, that reverses opioid-related overdoses or opioid emergencies. You also have epinephrine auto-injectors, brand name EpiPen. Those are going to treat the severe life-threatening allergic reactions. 
nitroglycerin tabs, brand name Nitrostat. These treat severe chest pains known as angina, an angina attack. This type of pain can actually precipitate or occur directly before a heart attack. So it's going to be important for that person to call 911 if they continue to have those pains after administering that. Inhalers, so ProAir, Ventolin, ProVental, uh, these are used for breathing disorders. Hypoglycemia medications, the most common one you might see is the glucagon injection. These actually treat dangerously low or severe, severely low blood sugar, okay? Anything that is applied to the genitals. So if you have a vaginal, penile, rectal, excuse me, rectal suppository enema or a topical medicine that is applied to the genital areas, those are not going to be observed or taken in front of staff. It's up to the program's uh, discretion if they want to allow the person to keep that on them for privacy reasons. So an example of that is Monistat, which is one of the very common over-the-counter medications that is used for a vaginal yeast infection. Uh, the program may also consider allowing medicated shampoos, scalp treatments, ointments, creams, toothpaste, or mouthwash, mouth rinse that's alcohol free on the patient or in their room. Uh, again, if someone needs to come down every time to the medication storage area to grab their medicated toothpaste, sometimes that can put a burden on the staff and can actually cause the patient to not use such toothpaste. So up to the program, it's at your discretion. Now, there are many different types of medication cabinets and storage units. We're going to go through these. Regardless of whatever cabinet or unit you use, it has to protect medications from diversion, theft, loss, contamination, and damage. The storage units should not be used to treat, I'm sorry, should not be used to store any non-medication items like cell phones, IDs, jewelry, or any other value, valuables. Freestanding units or easily moved units, such as a lockbox, should be secured to an immovable structure like the wall or the floor. Remember, an unsecured safe is not safe if someone can pick it up and move it. Uh, you can use an individual or a shared storage unit. An individual unit means separate units with individual locks for each. Examples of this is lockers or mailboxes or shared, which is one unit with a shared lock. So for example, a locking cabinet. The difference is an individual, there's going to be individual units for each individual patient or resident. Shared, there's going to be one large unit or maybe two large units, and these are shared among multiple residents or patients. Individual storage units. These protect patient confidentiality, prevent medications from being commingled and are known to reduce medication errors. They do this quite well. They are scalable, meaning that they can be, you can add on uh, more units as needed. Depends on what type of original storage unit you select, but some of them are scalable. They're also available in different sizes. There are options with key or keyless. So keyless would be a combination digital or biometric lock. You should, Definitely as a best practice, uh, select a locker, mailbox, or storage unit that fits the standard medication blister card. So what I mean by this is here's a blister card. It needs to be able to fit in that locker. So you need to make sure that the width and length and depth of that locker is going to fit a standard blister card. The size of that is five and three quarter inches wide and nine inches long. Good news is uh, the average PO box, so mailbox and the average uh, locker do accommodate that size, but just something to keep in mind, you definitely wanna check that before purchasing one of those units because you won't be able to store those blister cards in there. Storage systems with the open all mechanism um, can be particularly useful if a key is misplaced or you think a medication has been misfiled. What I mean by this is if you have a bank of lockers or a bank of mailboxes and there is one lock or uh, one button, there's something where you hit that and it opens all the doors. So you're able to search all the lockers at once without pulling out each individual key. Shared storage units. So these are, Typically more cost-effective option, they cost less than individual units. However, they're not going to protect patient confidentiality to the same level as individual units. Uh, 
they're typically not scalable. They do become more disorganized easily and they typically require more space than the individual units. Make sure that you are closing those doors immediately when retrieving or returning a medication to protect patient confidentiality. Remember, you leave the doors open, you have multiple patients in there, they can see someone else protected health information. A best practice is physically separate medications belonging to different residents with clear dividers, a sealable bag or an enclosed container, meaning a container with a lid. I would select a container with sufficient space. So what I mean by that is a container that was able to either hold, I would say up to 10 blister cards or at least up to 10 blister cards plus any medication bottles. Having multiple containers for one resident increases the likelihood of a medication error or a misfiling of a prescription. Patient privacy and safety. So again, medication bottles and blister packs contain protected health information, which is sometimes called PHI. Do not commingle resident medications, regardless if an individual or shared storage unit is used. Do not commingle them. That means you do not store one residence with another in the same box. You should absolutely separate medications belonging to different residents. Do separate resident medications from the facility supply of medications. Do separate current medications from inactive medications. So remove and separately store medications that are no longer needed, discontinued, or expired. Do separate predisposal medications, so inactive meds that are awaiting disposal from post-discharge medications. So an active medication that has been left behind by a resident. The worst thing that could happen is you do disposal that morning and the resident comes back and now you have discarded their medications and uh, their insurance company is not going to pay for prescription loss and the person is not able to take their medication for 15 to 30 days. So very important, predisposal, it's an inactive med, it's waiting to be disposed of, separate those from those post-discharge, meaning the medications that are actively being used but have been left behind by a resident, I would recommend holding on to post-discharge medications anywhere from 14 to 30 days because insurance companies typically will refill a medication within that time frame, or they will cover a loss. Okay, so best practice, one patient, one place. That means one bin, one locker, or one mailbox for that person. So. If you use a storage device with locked drawers, that means one patient per drawer. Do not commingle multiple people in that drawer. It really significantly increases the risk of a medication error. One patient per locked mailbox or locker, or one patient per container inside a larger shared lock cabinet. So as you can see all the way on the right, we have examples of medications stored in Tupperware containers that are enclosed with lids. All right, the picture on the left, this is what we're looking for. Yes, what do we have here? One patient per container. Containers are labeled with the full patient first and last name as it appears in the medication label. Medications are not dispensed with first name last initial for a reason. It does not meet the national patient safety standard for medications full first and last name as it appears on the legal medication or prescription label is what should be used to label any medication document or any medication storage um, container. This does not mean you need to put a label on the outside of someone's locker or on the outside of someone's mailbox because those are individual units. But if you have a large shared unit where you pull out the drawer or you open the doors, within a shared unit where multiple patients medications are stored, that's where you're gonna have to have a fully labeled container. The containers are also completely sealed. Here in this picture, they have a lid. The reason for completely sealing the um, containers, it's twofold. One, you don't want anything to fall in there that doesn't belong to that patient. And two, it actually helps protect the medications further from any humidity or any environmental uh, you know, elements. What you do not want to do is you don't want a drawer as shown to the right with multiple patients medications thrown in there that is commingling and it's disorganized. And then on the bottom right, you do see again, here's a drawer, it's pulled out, 
this particular place is just using blister packs or blister cards for their medications. However, it's organized, but again, the patient's uh, medications are completely commingled. So you do not want, it doesn't matter if it's organized or disorganized, the patient medications aren't separated here. So you need a clear separation, a clear divider, a, put it in a container, put it in a sealed bag, however you want to do that, but you, you really should not commingle these prescriptions. Now some second line storage options. Um, these ones are not ideal for daily medication storage due to increased likelihood of disorganization and medication errors. However, they are well suited for storing any of those large packages, bulk, excess, overstock, inactive, discontinued, or abandoned medications. So the ones that aren't being used daily. And this includes any lockable drawers, file cabinets, medication cards, safe lock boxes, or lockable toolboxes. Automated dispensing systems, sometimes these are called ADS. Um, these we really want you to avoid. Avoid using an automated or robotic dispensing cabinet or mach machine like OmniCell or Cubex unless you are legally authorized to dispense in the state of Massachusetts. These machines are used to dispense medications. They are not meant to store medications that have already been dispensed. Very big legal difference there. They're well suited for facilities and clinics that administer and or dispense medications or have medical staff on board. Uh, they are quite expensive and they do take a significant time uh, to program and enter each medication as well as the name, the quantity into the machine. Plus you're gonna have to most likely put in those expiration dates into each little cubby. Every machine is a little different. Another thing to keep in mind is uh, each machine, if it's, uh, being used to dispense medications or administer medications, uh, it requires a separate Massachusetts controlled substance registration to dispense those. You're going to have to reach out to the Office of Drug Control to, to obtain one of those. So it's an MCSR. Sometimes people are weary or a little anxious about using an individual storage unit because they're afraid that a key might be lost or uh, misfiled somewhere. So a great way to secure the storage keys is make sure you're putting them one in a safe place and notify a supervisor immediately if a key is missing. Um, if that cannot be located, you can always contact the storage unit manufacturers, the, the company that made that storage unit for a second set or a placement set of keys. Ways to secure these keys, we have a couple things at the bottom here. So all the way to the left, you can use a key envelope or a key pouch, and you can attach these directly to a medication binder or folder. You could use a key ring or a key box. Key box is the next picture over. You could put that right in the medication room. You could use a key binder or organizer. That is the next picture. And then all the way to the right, we have a key control cabinet. Any of these can be used to help organize and secure those keys. Just so everyone understands, under Massachusetts law, all prescription medications are controlled substances. That is what is under Chapter 94C, which is our Controlled Substances Act. That means all countable and non-countable prescription medications can be stored together because they are all controlled substances. What I mean by this is Schedule 2 to 6 are a prescription controlled medication. An example is amoxicillin or ibuprofen that is dispensed from a pharmacy your schedule two to five, those are also federally controlled. So those are countable controlled medications. So that is going to be things like Adderall, Suboxone. A separate countable controlled cabinet is not required by law to store those countable controlled medications, but it may be utilized. Uh, again, you can store all prescription medications together for a patient, whether it's countable or not, because they are all looked at as controlled substances under Massachusetts law. Dietary supplements, vitamins, and over-the-counter medications belonging to residents should definitely be locked up with their other medications. That is just a safety standard. They shouldn't just be given, you know, any OTC to go upstairs or a vitamin to go into their room or dietary supplements to keep in their purse or backpack. This can be a safety issue. And if the program provides medications, so like a house supply, such as Tylenol, these should also be locked up and they must be stored separately from resident medications. That's on the regulations. 
a few audience participation questions to cap us out here. Which of the following statements is true? A, over-the-counter medications, vitamins, and supplements do not need to be locked up. B, controlled countable medications and non-countable medications cannot be stored together. C, medications can be packed and brought to a resident's room before leaving on a weekend pass. Or D, house supplied medications must be locked up and stored separately from resident medications. Give you a few minutes to think about this. Really, we'll give 30 seconds. And you can answer in the chat box. All right, looks like most participants have answered. The answer is D. So again, all prescription medications are controlled substances in Massachusetts, whether it is an amoxicillin, a hepatitis C medication, an HIV medication, birth control, or Adderall, Suboxone, Vyvanse, Percocet, Oxycontin, they're all controlled substances. Whether you wanna put them in a separate controlled cabinet, that is up to the program's discretion, but is not required. Remember, your house supplied medications must always be locked up and stored separately from your resident medications. Next audience participation question. A facility has 15 patients currently prescribed buprenorphine naloxone, brand name Suboxone, the 8-2 milligram sublingual films. Which storage solution best protects patient privacy, prevents medication errors, and secures medications from theft and loss? A, store all Suboxone prescriptions together in one narcotic safe, so all 15 together. B, store all Suboxone prescriptions together with other countable medications in a controlled substance cabinet. C, store each Suboxone prescription separately with the resident's other medications in individual lockers. Or D, store each Suboxone prescription with the resident's other medications in a shared medication cabinet without dividers or boxes. We give about 30 seconds to put your answers in the chat box. Okay, the answer is C. So again, it said, what solution best protects patient privacy? The best way to protect patient privacy is keeping other patients' medications out of their site and physically separating them. So again, if you, unless every single person has their own narcotic safe or their own countable controlled substance cabinet, you are putting medications belonging to different residents, which are controlled substances under Massachusetts law together. If these are not separated physically, one, keeping them together is a risk. There's always an inherent risk with that. And two, if you do not, and it, it, again, securing from theft or loss, if they're all kept together, there is uh, evidence shows us and suggests that um, loss, theft, and diversion is more likely when medications are stored together and not separately when they belong to separate uh, patients. And then finally, if it is a shared medication cabinet, not having the dividers or the boxes that clearly separate the resident medications isn't going to secure them and is not going to protect the patient privacy. So in this particular example, the best answer is going to be storing each Suboxone prescription separately with the resident's other medications in their individual lockers. Our takeaway points, develop a policy and procedure to handle the maintenance monitoring and cleaning of medication storage units, including that medication refrigerator. Use a standalone refrigerator. Remember dorm style refrigerators that contain a freezer or defroster do not meet the FDA and USP storage requirements. Those are approved for food. They are not approved for storage of medications. Standalone refrigerators can be used though. Store medications in a timely manner upon arrival or delivery to the facility. This is going to help prevent any damage, loss, theft, or diversion. Using individual storage units or clearly labeled individual containers within a larger shared storage unit is recommended for safety and confidentiality reasons. And finally, keep those medication units organized and locked at all times. We're going to be taking a few questions after this. I want to thank everyone for joining this webinar. I hope you found the information uh, interesting and both meaningful for your programs.